Now, from CBS News Miami, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFiti. Welcome to Facing South Florida. I'm Jim DeFiti. Over the last few years, we have seen a startling increase in anti-Semitic attacks across the country and particularly here in Florida. FBI Director Christopher Wray recently testified before Congress that although only 2.4% of Americans are Jewish, 63% of all religiously motivated hate crimes are against Jews. And in Florida, we have seen a 300% rise in anti-Semitic attacks since 2012. Now, we've discussed the problem in Florida in the past. Last year, we reported on this report from the Anti-Defamation League, Hate in the Sunshine State. But this is not a problem that gets fixed easily or quickly. So I wanted to continue the conversation about anti-Semitism in our community. Now, when he became president, President Joe Biden named Deborah Lipstadt as a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, the first person to hold that position. She was confirmed by the U.S. Senate last year, and this week I spoke to Ambassador Lipstadt and Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. It, I'm going to give you an answer which might surprise some of your listeners. One of the first things I, I, I felt I have to do and that I've been doing in the, in the 16 months I've been in office is to get people to understand what is anti-Semitism. Too often they ignore it, they laugh it off, they don't think it's serious, they don't think it's important. They look around and they only see Jews who seem to be well situated. Uh, what are they complaining about? So to get people to understand what it is and to get people to speak out against it, Jews and non-Jews, it doesn't matter, to say that's unacceptable. You can't say that, you can't do that. That is prejudice. Um, and the other thing that I feel very strongly about, and I think the Congresswoman shares my views on, on this, uh, as well as many other things, is that it's also necessary for people to understand the interconnectedness of anti-Semitism, that the people who hate Jews and despise Judaism, uh, despise other minorities, despise other groups, despise other religions, and that you have to fight this strongly, but you also have to recognize you can't fight in silos. I couldn't agree with the ambassador more, and it's been really such a privilege to work so closely with her. Uh, and Jim, that's one of the reasons that uh, I know you're aware I, I hosted uh, really the first of its kind in our community, a, a, a summit to combat anti-Semitism here in South Florida, because we've repeatedly had, had to come together uh, as a community across faiths, culture, um, and, and various levels of leadership to, to really call out attacks on the Jewish community and attacks on other communities, frankly, because we wanted to make sure that we came together around the notion that an attack on one community is an attack on all. Uh, but we have had a recent precipitous rise in anti-Semitism here, and it's come in the form of everything from graffiti sprawled on, sprawled on playgrounds to literal physical attacks on uh, an individual who was speaking Hebrew in my district to uh, you know, you, things hurled at individuals to flyers on drive, anti-Semitic flyers on driveways. But, you know, the education that's so critical that Ambassador Lipstadt just mentioned is it's not, it's, it's not just um, people speaking out against overt anti-Semitism. There is a lot of unfamiliarity with what certain phrases and anti-Semitic tropes are and that have become so common and embedded in our lexicon that we also have to use the opportunity like Jewish American Heritage Month is to educate our fellow Americans who may not be as familiar with the Jewish heritage and traditions and that we're a religion and a rich heritage and a culture and the contributions we've made to the success of the United States of America. Ambassador, is there something about our political discourse today that is allowing or emboldening these types of, of brazen acts? Because uh, I'm trying to discern whether or not these are folks who are committing these anti-Semitic acts, whether or not they always had these feelings, but felt that they could sort of, had to sort of suppress expressing it. And is there something now that lets them 
feel as if this is something that is okay to publicly come out, or are we creating a new generation of anti-Semitic individuals and groups? Uh, my answer is yes. <laughs> On one hand, it is it is a atmosphere where people who may have felt this way before now feel it's okay to say it. And that's not just about anti-Semitism, about racism, homophobia, misogyny, things that they would have said maybe quietly one to the other, they now feel it's okay to say. And they have a medium, social media, which which I use all the time, but they their misuse of social media is so dangerous. So that's one part. But as in the second part of your question in creating a new generation, people, kids, young people, and not so young people see this and say, oh, I've heard that about Jews. I've heard that about whatever you fill in the name of the group. Oh, yeah. And, and so it both allows and it creates. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a, a toxic mass coming down a hill. It's toxic in and of itself, but as it spreads, it infects other people ground, the groundwork. Uh, Congresswoman, I know that, that one of the things that uh, concerns you is the type of political discourse that you're seeing around the country, but also here in Florida. Uh, do you attribute it to, to more of, of a responsibility by elected officials to stand up to it more, to repudiate it even among those who, who, may con who they may consider supporters of theirs? And is enough being done along that regard? You know, I think we each, it's important for leaders to take responsibility to call out anti-Semitism, as, as the ambassador said, but it is incumbent upon all good people to to call out and to to name uh, the the hate that is spewed by others when it's, whether it's overt or whether it's in, indirect and someone may not realize that they have communicated in, in an offensive and discriminatory and bigoted way. And I, I think it's really important to stress what Ambassador Lipstadt just mentioned, is that because hate has no borders and the exponential increase that we've seen has really resulted uh, significantly because of the hate that is virally spreading online. Uh, and our social media companies, certainly individuals who are making these posts have a responsibility to, uh, you, you know, to, to be called out and to, to bring their activity to a halt. But the social media companies need to be held accountable because they are using their technology through their algorithms to continually deliver more content, more hate content to people whose eyeballs seek it. We have to make sure that we balance the need for social media companies to take responsibility themselves, to pull down hate, which they're not doing aggressively enough, and also to regulate it when they refuse. I know the FBI director recently testified uh, before Congress that, you know, although American Jews account for 2.4 percent of the population, 63 uh, percent of religious, religiously motivated hate crimes were against Jewish individuals. And, and Ambassador, I, I noted in an op-ed you wrote, it was something that, that made me think about this a little bit differently. You wrote, that there is no Jewish institution that does not have security at the door. At my synagogue, police officers and congregants patrol the grounds. If they do not recognize you as a regular, they question you. It's different from the church across the street where the doors are open and all who wish to enter are welcome. That's a, it's a, it's a, it's a reality, but it's also a sad reality given, but especially given what we saw with Tree of Life and, and some of the other attacks that we've seen over time. When you stand in front of the synagogue I attend in Atlanta, across the street is a large church with which we have very good relations. Its doors are open. All who want to come, welcome. And when you approach our synagogue, the gate is closed. There's a, even on Shabbat, there's a police, especially on Shabbat, there's a police car there with the light flashing. And they're going to ask you who you are. And if, the, if you pass muster, they're going to welcome you. But it's not a very welcoming situation. Or we have day schools. And I know you have many Jewish day schools in Southern Florida where the kids are used to the fact that when the carpool pulls up, instead of just getting online with all the other parents or people picking up the carpools, 
uh, that there's going to be a guard there asking who you are. That's their reality. They're far worse things. Just uh, a few months ago, I was in Tunisia and I went to the island of Jerba off the coast of Tunisia, where there is an age old festival held between Passover and uh, the Feast of Weeks Shavuot. And it's been going on for thousands of years. Jews come, they celebrate. It was infectious. It was infectious to be part of something so age old. It was infectious to be part of this celebration, which attacks, attracts Jews worldwide and non-Jews, because it's such an interesting historical phenomenon. And there is a Jewish community living in the midst of this Muslim community, and they live together in, in harmony for centuries. Some Tunisian uh, uh, officer stationed on the island took his, his gun and drove to the synagogue and killed four people at the synagogue and previously had killed one of his colleagues when he left his post. Um, and I had been there 24 hours before in the very spot where the shooting took place. And it was, it's horrific, you know, you mentioned Tree of Life Synagogue, I'm going to visit there next week, the building is about to be torn down, who would want to worship in a, in a, in a building that was the site of such carnage. I'm just going to add, and I was just at Tree of Life Synagogue a few weeks ago and met with the uh, families and the rabbi and actually walked through I was right after the, the the last part of the trial and walked through with the families who had not been through since the shooting for the first time. And it was devastating. And so as dark and as horrific as that experience was, um, you have right in our own community, the Chabad of Southwest Broward, who has had a very close working relationship and friendship with the mosque right next door to them for, for decades. And that's why the U.S. national strategy to counter anti-Semitism that President Biden insisted upon uh, is so critical, because it's going to take an all of government, a whole of government approach to make sure that we can embed the unity and, and the policies to ensure that we can have the kind of pushback necessary and the, the, the legal infrastructure necessary to stop anti-Semitism in its tracks and to raise enough awareness and education to ensure that naturally occurs as well. When we come back, finding solutions to the affordable housing crisis in Florida. Stay with us. Welcome back. For 12 years, Jeff Brandis served in the state legislature, where he developed a reputation for seeking solutions to complex problems that many of his colleagues shied away from. Term limits ended his time in Tallahassee, but Brandis, a Republican from the Tampa Bay area, formed a new think tank called Florida Policy Project to push for reforms and what he calls best practices to be implemented in Florida government. Now, I spoke to him about what he is hoping to achieve. So my big takeaway after 12 years in Tallahassee is everything in Tallahassee is tactical. There is no strategy. Um, and I can tell you that having you know served in a variety of different roles, uh, I can't tell you what the strategy was for property insurance. I couldn't tell you what the strategy was for, for housing affordability, criminal justice. Uh, you know, I would say the only area that I felt like there was real strategy was education. And that was because Jeb Bush and Patricia Levesque started the Foundation for Florida's Future and focused on uh, on universal school choice as the overall strategy for what we wanted to accomplish. And so the Florida Policy Project is brought, born out of that idea of you need an outside entity that's kind of pushing the best practices uh, into the marketplace, into the uh, kind of into the policy world. And so what we do is we go out and contract and work with our professors from our tier one universities. And we ask them to come up with the answers for the to the question of what is the best practice in each one of those areas. And we break them down into sub pieces and we've produced nine pieces of policy reports so far. And uh, our goal is to produce one piece of policy report every month. And I know the, the initial emphasis was on the issue of affordability in Florida, which of course is a, is a, is a very complicated problem, one with no easy solutions. So it tends to be one of the reasons why the legislature and government doesn't tackle it because there isn't a quick fix to it. But tell me, give me your summation as to what, the, what those reports say when it comes to the affordability issues and what may be able to be done about it. Sure. So the bottom line is money from Tallahassee is part of the solution. 
but it all it's going to require the hard work of local governments to change zoning laws to allow for accessory dwelling units to consider smaller lot sizes ultimately what the report says it's a supply and demand problem and you have to put on more supply of housing and it's not just apartments like the live local act kind of uh puts out there it's more at the local level with uh smaller smaller units and frankly just more available units in places where people want to live this is not sending people out to the suburbs this is saying listen we've got to do things more in the in the core of communities in order to ensure that there's housing at the middle kind of the middle level of housing available to everybody i always think of housing as a pyramid if you don't have enough housing at the top they push out the people in the middle and the people put in the middle push out the people at the bottom and so you really have to build at all levels and that's really what our report highlights now you know obviously the legislature this past year at the urging and the guidance of uh, Senate President uh, Kathleen Pasadomo, she made that a priority, trying to pass some legislation with it. I think that there are some good elements in that bill, although I do think that there is some troubling elements, one of which is sort of that top-down approach where Tallahassee sort of circumvents the authority of local governments and takes away local governments' ability to adapt. So right now there seems to be an issue where developers may be able to use the law that was passed to create really high density in residential neighborhoods that the local community may not want, but now may not be able to stop. That's the trick, right? The balancing act between the, the interests of, of the people versus what Tallahassee wants and what developers want. Well, ultimately, I think the Live Local Act was much more focused on apartment complexes and apartment developments, and that's a piece of the pie. But so the simple truth is the hard work has to be done at the city and county level to add more supply. And there's a few ways we can do that. Um, we can allow for accessory dwelling units. People call them mother-in-law suites. We can allow for smaller lot sizes. We should be focused on upzoning to allow, instead of just single family homes in neighborhoods, allowing duplexes or quads uh, in those neighborhoods. Anything we can do to provide more supply. Listen, Florida faces 800 people a day moving to the state. That isn't slowing down. And we've got to have housing or people are just going to get priced out. It seems like housing is one of the drivers that creates the high inflation rate that Florida now, now uh, suffers from. I think our inflation rate in Florida is higher than the national average and maybe higher than just about any other state right now in terms of what we're doing. The governor would say that that's part of the success of people coming to Florida. You made mention of 800 folks a day coming into the state. Uh, but you know, when you can't have a place for them to live, when insurance prices, and we'll talk about insurance more in a second, continues to be to increase, how do you combat those inflationary that inflationary trend? We're at a very strange time in Florida right now. Think about this. New home sales are actually cheaper. It's actually cheaper almost to go into a new home than it is to buy an existing home, which is something we really haven't seen for decades in Florida. At the end of the day, we, we have we've got to address supply. And if we don't address having enough supply, this demand is not going to change. This demand is coming. We know this demand is coming. We've got to provide more supply in places where people want to live. And that means the hard work has to be done at the city and county level. It needs to be supported by Tallahassee. Give me your assessment now of where we are when it comes to uh, property insurance, you know, homeowners insurance, windstorm insurance. Where are we today in Florida? Well, things have have the seas have changed right so le the legislature back in december passed uh, through a major piece of legislation to deal with the litigation and tort reform uh, that went into effect in april of this year and that's the challenge for people is that we, everybody wants to see the immediate results we've always said it's going to take 18 to 24 months past the legislature enacting the legislation um, and it going into effect for us to see real results but i think we are seeing a lot of signs of life we're starting to see the discussion about new companies forming. We're starting to see a lot of companies talking about taking policies out of citizens. That's incredibly positive um, and a direction we haven't seen in three or four years, frankly, uh, because what you're seeing now is the, there's an opportunity now. Now, the, the challenge is most of your property insurers still have legacy lawsuits that will go on for three to five years for those companies. But I think you will see new entrants in the marketplace. And I think that overall is a net positive for the state. Unfortunately, it's going to be a rough 2023, uh, probably a, a stable or a you know, stable 2024. And I think in 2025, you start seeing prices come down. You know, I realize that for the health of the market, the idea of having new companies come in, taking 
taking share away from citizens is a good thing in the long term, but I also realize, and you and I both know, that what that usually means in the short term is for those people who are in citizens, who will get taken out of citizens by these new companies, are likely to see pretty substantial rate hikes because the legislature will allow those new companies to take over, you know, take over uh, entrance into citizens by by also raising their rates. Uh, talk to me about what you think homeowners can expect if they get, start getting taken out of citizens. Well, I think they should expect that rates are going to go up for them if they get taken out of citizens. Understand, citizens' rates are not based on actuarial math; they're based on a legislative uh, kind of fiction where the legislature artificially years ago set their prices. And the new law uh, that came into effect looks to rectify some of that. And, and the, but, but what you have to do is recognize that you've got to get these policies out of citizens. There, there can be no private market if citizens is undercutting the private market by 40, 50 percent and frankly subsidizing the risk to the rest of Floridians uh, who are paying who are paying who are going to pay for that if there's a storm. It seems that in the legislature, there are often a lot of reports written. There are commissions founded. There are groups that come together, you know, and study an issue and then present it. And then so often those reports just sort of get tucked into a draw somewhere, uh, in part because of term limits and new speaker or a new Senate president comes in with a different set of priorities. And so everything gets shifted. What's going to be different with the way you're approaching this in terms of how do you take the work that you are creating in terms of these policy papers, and then get an audience to actually listen to and enact some of the recommendations. Oftentimes when you see in Tallahassee from different think tanks, it basically they become hired guns. You know, they'll give you the answer that you want if you pay for the report. That's not what our goal is. Our goal is just identifying best practices. And so when legislators have questions about what is the, the answers to some of these char challenging problems, they have one place to go. They don't have to go sort, sort through 10 or dif 10 different think tanks to think about it. Two, we write, our, we write our reports for legislators. They're short, they're five to seven pages and we link to the larger ones uh, down the road. And then we, we're using policy experts largely based in Florida. We're using our public universities and our public researchers to do that work. The other thing is, listen, we ask the questions, but the professors and the experts come up with the answers. That's our, that's a kind of our, our, our pathway forward here. That we also focus on just four policy areas, really. Criminal justice, property insurance, transportation, and housing are the four kind of pillars that we're building off of. Ultimately, we think multiple reports on those areas, which are some of the most challenging in the state, are going to attract attention. And, and finally, I was a legislator for 12 years. I know what works and what doesn't. Listen, we're not going to take on sentencing reform as part of criminal justice under a DeSantis administration. But you are going to see reports on reentry, on elderly in prison, and veterans in prison. Those are coming out in the next month or so. And so, you know, it's kind of using that political knowledge of gained over 12 years the, the recognition that most legislators don't know where to turn. And if we can be that repository of best ideas produced, not by Jeff Brandis, but by experts in the field, uh, then I think there's something of value. And frankly, that's what they're telling me as well. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us. You can follow me on the app previously known as Twitter at Defeaty or email me at jdefeaty at cbs.com. Now, we're going to be off for the Labor Day weekend, so we'll see you in two weeks. Until then, thanks again for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.